All right, hey folks, so uh, this is part three of the January Q&A, and let's get straight into this. Firstly, uh, we have David Wang. He says, hi Faz, love the content, thank you, David. Uh, for shorter lifters, what's your take on doing a bit more volume than taller lifters? I know females can generally handle more volume than males. I think this is because they are generally smaller and weaker. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna get you lynched, David. Uh, shorter limbs, so less damage. Fatigue and force produced during exercises, therefore needing more volume. Um, would this apply for shorter males? Have you seen this trend with any of your clients? Thanks again. I think the general pervading wisdom with um, female clients is that they can typically do more work because they tend not to be quite as glycotic as males and they don't have the higher levels of testosterone. So their peak force isn't as high, which is why when they are doing resistance training, it's generally with slightly lower percentages. So um, you can get a uh, you can get a girl, for example, who's um, who's just able to do a tremendous amount more reps with like higher percentage weights, um, just because the difference between her eight rep max and her one rep max, for example, isn't really that high. It's just due, due to a lack of peak force output. I think that's what is generally considered to be um, what what the explain how we explain things. Um, I don't know. I think those kind of comparisons are not actually that useful in a practical setting because you have to work with someone or if it's your own body, you have to figure out, well, what what do I need? So David, here's what I would say. I, I would get you to not think too much about it, you know, like whether you're short, whether you're tall. Um, I don't think it matters, to be honest, even whether you're a male or female. Um, start with a reasonable amount of volume. You know, again, 10 to 20 sets is reasonable. If you're doing mostly compounds, then stick to the lower end. If you're doing a bit more bodybuilder style crap, then you can go a bit more to the higher end. See if you gain. If you're gaining, then it's enough. And my usual rule of thumb is, if you're gaining, great, carry on with doing what you're doing. If you're not gaining and you're getting all beat up and sore, well, that means you're doing too much. If you're not gaining and you're fresh and you're good to go, then you're probably not doing enough. So. Yeah, I'd urge you to think about things in that way, David. In that way, rather than try, because the problem is, right, if you say, okay, look, I'm shorter, I'm going to do less volume, blah, blah, blah. Then the next time you come up to a plateau, again, you're going to look for an external source of information. I want you to get into the habit of looking at your own training diary and looking at, say, okay, well, what do I need to do to gain? Start to build your own strategy. And I think that's really important. Your, tr your training diary is your best source of information on you except for fast lifts on YouTube. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, so yeah, your training diary is your, is your best source of information. Use that to, to fuel your, um, your training knowledge, what works for you. That's what I did when I was younger. You know, I, um, I've told this story many times. I, I messaged Dan John, you know, the American, um, coach where he used to coach weightlifting, I think, but a really nice guy. He's still around and he's, he's still great. Uh, I messaged him in about 2003. And I had my first major plateau. And he said to me, Faz, look through your training diary, try and find any trends. So I did. And it was my first form of periodization. I realized every three weeks, something would happen. I would get an ache and niggle. So I, I deloaded every three weeks. And that year, my progress just skyrocketed up because I found something that worked for me. I mean, I could have looked online and looked to see what people were doing. And I did. But that piece of advice was specific to me. So you, David, look at your training diary. Do do some a set amount of volume for 12 weeks. Look at the training diary, see what happened. See what happened to the individual body parts as well. See what gained, what didn't, what the trends were, and then start to make changes based on that. Execute, evaluate, adjust, execute, evaluate, adjust, etc., etc. Do it for you. Don't do it because you're short, because you're tall, whatever. Just do it for you. There are way too many factors which we don't even know about which might affect our volume requirements. We can't take one arbitrary factor and say, well, that's what we're gonna decide on. We can't do it. So next question. Next question, here we go. Okay, Omar, is it a consideration that the type of cardio we do needs to be rotated the same way weight training exercises are due to avoid overuse injuries? Yeah, I think it is. Um, Omar says he uses the stationary bike um, roughly three times 45 to 60 minutes weekly. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, the way I see it, Omar, is it's like a pyramid of how often you need to change things, right? 
at the top of the pyramid is the <laughs> or YMCA thing. <laughs> at the top of the pyramid, it's um, the single repetition maximum effort stuff. That needs to be rotated the most often, right? At the bottom of the pyramid is the low intensity cardio. That stuff needs to be rotated the least, okay? The least often. So as you get more and more close to all out maximum effort lifts, so maybe for example, or, you know, like a, the one rep max, rotate that very often. A five rep max to a 10 rep max to a 15 rep max, rotate it less often. Cardio that you might do, which is at a low intensity, you can rotate that the least often. So it depends on what's how how hard you're going with the cardio because 60 minutes on a bike could be sweating, um, exhaustion, you get off, you, you want to drink, you want to collapse. Or it could be 60 minutes in the style of pace where you can have a chat with a, com with a buddy next to you, hardly break a sweat. So it depends how you're doing it. The closer it is to hard work, the more often you have to rotate it. So to answer that question, I think you've got to, you've got to think you're not going to have to rotate it as often as your training exercises, but you are going to have to rotate it at a certain point. I mean, I just for me, for my point of view, I probably wouldn't do three sessions of, of just list cardio. If I were you, I would at least do, yeah, maybe one session of list, maybe another session of intervals, you know, um, something like, it doesn't have to be crazy, just something like 60 seconds hard, maybe one, two minutes easy just to start to bump up the effect on the heart to get that uh, faster, build, just, just build the cardio um, strength faster. And then maybe one more day, take your pick. So I would mix it up now just so you get a better broad benefits of things. So one hour, one long cardio session, one or two short sessions, you know, and then, yeah, maybe a third session of something, to take your pick. But yeah, I would probably start mixing it up now. I don't think it's wise to do. I just think it's, you can get more of a benefit. You can use the long cardio to work certain aspects of your cardio. You can use the shorter, harder interval training to work other aspects of your VO2 max and stuff like that. Okay. Hopefully that was useful, Omar. S. Lee says, for an extremely torso dominant lifter, so his chest and back grow easily, his arms suck. Should I add a dedicated arm day? I'm not a fan of arm days, really. I'm just not. Um, S. Lee, I would ask you, how strong are you? You know, like, are you a three plate bencher? Are you a, you know, can you chin with 60 to 80 kilos around your waist? Are you genuinely strong? Or are you deciding that you're a chest and back dominant lifter? Maybe you can bench two plates. You don't really know at that stage. Like, I mean, I know, <laughs> I know two plates is a decent bench, so no offense to anyone out there, but like it's not, you're not going to go anything close to fulfilling your potential at um, a two player side bench or whatever. So if you're not actually that strong, your first, you can't answer that question. So your first point of call is get strong first and then decide whether you actually have a weakness or not. Right now, we, we don't know if you have a weakness or not. You, you can't tell. Um, so I don't, and I, so I don't typically think a dedicated arm day is a great idea. Um, if you're still growing. If you're nothing close to having a three plate bench, four plate squat, five plate deadlift, I don't think you've got any business doing an arm day really. Like include arm work, sure, you know, but um, you're gonna get a lot from compounds assuming you have a nice balance routine. You can do a lot by really pounding the benches, the chins, uh, the overhead presses, the rows. Um, so I, if you are truly advanced, if you're walking around benching three plates for reps and chinning with 60 to 80 kilo around your waist, then yeah, maybe have an arm day. Sure. I just don't think you're in a position to see right now. I'm going to guess you're probably still relatively underweight and you're still relatively under strength. Um, I think in that case, you've just got to stick to your guns, keep going and um, get stronger and you'll know when you're bigger. And I'll give you an example. Up until, so I reached a 180, well, 190, um, and over that squat, so a um, like a 400 to 450 pound squat and a 500 to 520 pound deadlift way before my bench press caught up and my bench was still at about 220. Now, I my look changed dramatically from when I was benching two plates aside to when I was benching three and eventually four plates aside. Like it was huge, but my bench lagged well behind. Now, what caused my bench to go up eventually was 
I just ate my body weight up from the 80 kilo range to the 95 kilo range. As I got bigger, the size came on last in the chest and shoulders. So it might just be the case for you. You either need to get stronger or get a lot bigger or a combination of both. Um, I'm guessing that's probably more likely what it is. And so I don't see the need for an arm day. I think it'll just slow your progress. And as a net negative, you might actually cause tendon stress, which will affect your prog progression on your on your actual main lifts. I still think that's a priority. Yeah. Sorry if that's not the answer you're looking for, but uh, I think that's the, that's the right answer. So Mickey Chan, is pharma walk beneficial to hypertrophy and powerlifting performance? No, I don't think it is. I don't like the risk to reward ratio. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think it's a great hypertrophy exercise at all. Um, I used to do loads of it. I used to farmers walk behind every session. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, when no one was doing farmers walks at my gym in like 2000, 2001, I was doing them. I even built my own custom handles. Um, so I built like thick bar handles that I could wrap around the plates and I, I, I lugged them to the gym in my backpack and I, you know, I'm so, yeah, I mean, I've had plenty of experience doing farmer's walks. So they're not for hypertrophy. They're not for powerlifting performance. Then for neither of those things, they're very specific to like holding strength. Uh, they're very specific to maybe far like, yeah, carries in, in, in strongman basically. Um, there are better options for hypertrophy, which are, cause less stress on your body. Even a regular standing shrug is better for hypertrophy. I would always prefer a rearward shrug for hypertrophy for the upper back, um, as well as what you get from rows and deadlifts and chins. For powerlifting, absolutely not. No. For powerlifting, all I ever did was I did lots of rearward shrugs. Um, I deadlifted with straps every time. Never had a problem with my grip because my upper back was strong. And if I did need grip, I would do standing holds in the power rack. You see, what I've not really talked about previously is I actually used to compete in grip competitions in the UK, in Stafford, in the UK. There's a guy called David Horn, who's a um, powerlifting, he's, a, he's an arm wrestling champion. And he's also uh, like, he's like an amateur strongman. But anyway, he has this whole thing set up, grip competitions. And it's like an hour drive from where I, when I was living as a kid. So um, I would go over and I would compete in grip. I competed in the grip world championships <laughs> in 2002. It's a really weird sport, but I mean, it was fun. You know, you're young, you, you, you try things. And it was all events related to grip. So it was like, you know, crushing grip strength, like the grip of the crusher, the, grip, the captains of crush grippers. It was farmer's walk type of strength. It was carries, it was loads finger strength, all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I like doing that because of those reasons, but um, it had no carryover to hypertrophy or powerlifting at all. It's a fun exercise. Go for it. It'll probably build your traps. It's just not massively beneficial because, well, there are better exercises to build the traps, you know? So, all right, Jimmy, how do you select a training split when you can't have set training days? This is a very good question. I've got a very good answer for you. So the answer is this, use full body routines, okay? Now, specifically with full body routines, um, like for example, my routine, The Wizard, yeah? Now with The Wizard, you, in the first, first um, version of The Wizard, um, the, the, the sort of the, the beginner to intermediate level, you've got three training days, a heavy day, a light day, and a medium day. Now, the light day is sort of a recovery day. So if you're, in a position where you have to skip a day, you can always attempt to skip the light day, do the heavy day, and then maybe the medium day, and just sort of rotate the days. So the nice thing about full body routines is you just come back around to it. And the next time you are you have time to go to the gym, you've not really missed a body part because you're training your entire body every day. Whereas I think if you do a body part split, and let's say you've got, I don't know, a traditional bro, bro split, um, you know, chest, back, delts, legs and arms. Now, if you miss the last two days of the week, well, that's your legs and arms missed off. So then you have to kind of start the cycle again. With a full body, you can just take the next full body exercise, felt full body session the next time you're at the gym. You're not missing out on very much and you're still able to train a body part as often as you can because it's just limited by how often you're in the gym. So that's kind of how I would, how I would place it. Now, he's gone on to say, some weeks you may have to train two or three days in a row or some weeks it can be um, a day on a day off etc so that's a little bit more uh, complicated but again i don't think it's that different here's what i would do with you jimmy 
I would look at your exercises and sets and reps on during the week as a tick box activity. Okay, so hear me out. Let's say, for example, over the course of a week, let's just take chest. Over the course of the week, you are doing bench presses, incline press, close grip bench, and dips. Those are your four chest exercises, which you're going to do for three sets each, okay? 12 sets. Now, you know on Monday morning, that's what you've got to do for the rest of the week. And let's say you need to train two or three days in a row. Okay, get your volume in across those days. Now, if you have to train two days in a row, okay, maybe you can do half the work at the beginning of the week, half the work at the end of the week, so it'll be kind of like an upper-lower. If you have to train three days in a row, maybe you can do a push-pull legs. But basically, at the beginning of every week, you arrange your exercises in a way that means you can get them all in. Just think of your all of your exercises as a list of things you have to get through during the course of the week. And you can literally arrange your split however you like during that week to get those exercises in and to try and progress. It's not ideal. Of course it's not, but you have less than ideal circumstances. But as long as you're ticking the boxes of getting the exercises in and trying to progress, well, it'll work. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, I think, the best option for you. And it's, it's a good way to do things because the split doesn't really matter. It's more to do with overall weekly volume and it's being consistent with the exercises. So just think of it like that. And this is really good advice for people who maybe are on odd shifts at work. Just think of your week of training as a list of exercises which you have to tick off and try and get better at. The order which you do them is meaningless, really. It doesn't really matter too much. It has a minute difference in terms of overlap, but practically speaking, it doesn't affect things that much. Plus, you have less than ideal circumstances, so you're going to have to just take that on the chin. So that's how I would do it, Jimmy. All right, HC says, can you get stronger in minimal volume? Okay, good question. Now, I looked at this question, and I looked at this question a couple of times, and I also looked up um, this chap who asked me the question, on his previous comments on the channel. And um, he mentioned that um, he has some sort of, um, you know, condition, which means he can't do a great deal of volume. Now, I'm not going to be the ones to sit here and say, you, you can't get strong in a minimal volume. I don't, I'm not going to be the one to tell you that because we all have to make do with the best of our circumstances. And I'm not going to sit here and say you can't gain on minimal volume, even though I have gone on record on YouTube in the past and said minimal volume is not the way forward. Okay, but I'm not going to sit here and, and piss in your cornflakes because that's not me. It's not my style. I want to encourage you. So, two bits of advice I can give you. Firstly, um, do what you can in the situation you have. Okay, do what you can. This is what we all do. Okay? This is what we all do. We all do the best in the situation we have. We all have barriers. We all have something that holds us back, whether it's mental barrier, whether it's our age, whether it's the fact we don't want to gain weight, whether it's the fact that we have difficulty gaining weight, whether it's the fact that we were fat growing up, whether it's the fact we, we just aren't very aggressive in the gym, whether it's the fact that we just haven't got that get up and go for the gym. You know, We all have something which holds us back. So, But we all try. So that just try with as much volume as you can handle despite your condition and your body will adapt okay most of the time the arguments for and against high volume and low volume boil down to the speed of the results there are some concerns over the safety of minimal volume and i think that's something i would echo i don't think it's a particularly safe approach to do the least possible so try and do what you can the problem with minimal volume is that it can leave you open to injuries because you're just not getting full body strong. You need to attack things from different angles. You need to ensure that you have a range of variety at a certain level. It will help you staying injury free. However, if that's not on the cards and you literally can't recover from that volume, do what you can, try and progress, go in with a, with a good attitude. The next thing is you can probably adapt to more over time, probably. I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice, of course. Um, and I don't know your actual condition, but it's highly likely that you will be able to adapt over time as your body, your confidence in your whole mentality towards training gets better. I suspect, and I don't mean that as a condescending thing. I mean, we all have that. We all get better over time. But I suspect you will be able to do more and more volume and take on more. So I would encourage you to aim to do as much as you can, 
in the situation you're in while you're still able to recover from it and grow from it and get stronger you know so yeah the, the bottom line is for for anyone else listening i i'm not a fan of minimal volume because i've been there i i really flew the flag for minimal volume when i was younger and all that it leads to is um in general um piss poor um piss poor expectations stagnation injury and there's just there's there's a whole community of guys out there who really bang the drum for low volume and they're all mediocre so even 20 years later they're all mediocre so i'm just like what a waste of life um for you hc like if this is all you can do then just you're already a warrior you're already a warrior for trying to and i'm not just trying to gas you up here but you are if you have a condition which is genuinely preventing you from doing a lot in the gym and you're trying hard and you're asking questions on youtube then you're already a warrior so you're already a step ahead because you're not letting that let you let hold you down so you do what you can stay safe try and progress and just trust that over time your capacity to work will improve because it more than likely will hopefully that was a re reasonable answer um i did i did mean that in the, with the best of intentions um so hopefully you, you took that in the right way all right uh super mongol says can't progress on exercise should i add more sets so um my rule of thumb is this if you can't progress and you are gaining weight because remember gaining weight gaining muscle is a lot easier if you're gaining weight around about one percent per month is about right so if you've ruled that out and you're sleeping enough you know six to eight hours per night then here's my rule of thumb if you are not progressing and you are sore all the time then you're doing too much Okay, and you're probably in the region of 20 sets or so per muscle group per week, or you have a very physically demanding, excuse me, physically demanding job. If you're not progressing and you just don't feel anything, you feel great, then you're probably not doing enough. Simple, nice and easy. So should you add more sets, depending on which category you're in, add more sets or take some away. Okay, Paladin Dance says alternative dumbbell curls versus simultaneous. They're just variations, dude. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, over the course of your lifetime, you're probably going to do both. You probably should do both. They're just variations. Um, I like them one. Out, I like them uh, both at the same time, simultaneous. Um, just because biceps get the work in. There's no real value to doing them single, one arm at a time. It's a bit silly bodybuilder thing to do, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, single leg, leg work, I can get, you know, single, single limb leg work. I understand, um, split squats, leg presses, stuff like that. <sighs> Alternate dumbbell kills simultaneous. It's just variation, dude. It doesn't matter. Have PRs for each and, um, yeah, just, just, uh, pick one for a while, do it. And then when you stall out, pick another, right. That is it for YouTube. So I'm going to go over to Instagram. Quite a few questions there. This will probably go over onto a fourth part, which is great, by the way. Thank you guys for the questions. Uh, right, right. Sunil, one of my long-term clients, plant-based with Sunil. He's uh, he's one of my vegan clients. Really nice guy. Does Faz have a morning routine? Yes, I do, actually. Yes, I do. So, um, yeah. My morning routine is this. Um, after I've got up and I've weighed in, um, what I generally do is I pop downstairs. Now, I start the morning with about a liter of water. So I'll go down to the kitchen. Um, I'll put the kettle on. <laughs> and while the kettle's on, I will just neck a liter of water, like just standing in the kitchen, just neck it. <laughs> and that's how I start my day. Now, once the kettle's boiled, I'll make myself about a liter of tea or coffee depending on what i'm interested in on the day and then i'll also fill up that liter bottle again with another liter of fluids so within that morning so from whenever i wake up and get to my desk to about midday i would have had about three liters of fluids which i think is a good important way to start the day i'll also then take any supplements that i'm taking like right now i'm experimenting with uh, saffron extract just a bit different. <laughs> so I take any supplements that I'm supposed to take and any like health things like vitamin D and whatnot. And then I'll sit down and I'll carry on working. So I, I have a very small window of time between um, bed to getting at my desk. I generally get my fluids in, I start working. 
And then I work pretty much solidly till about midday when I have my breakfast. So that's kind of it. Like I just like to get on and, and going. Any sort of meditation type stuff I do near the end of the day where I relax. But um, I guess maybe it's just my previous career as a teacher. I just like to get straight into it. So um, I will get up, you know, get, get ready, um, go straight down, get my fluids in and make sure I'm set for the morning. So I, I think it's important to stay hydrated. So um, yeah, I'll have about three liters of fluids just before breakfast um, and then take my supplements and just get straight to work. That's kind of my routine. Um, hopefully that was interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure it was. All right. So let's go with, you know, we, we're going to end with this. Uh, Jason, who's another one of my clients, really nice guy. Um, how does it feel whenever you have amazing success with a client? And how does it feel being one of the fitness Avengers in the fitness community? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, would, I, would you guys call me the fitness Avenger? Uh, it's very nice. It's very complimentary. Thank you. Um, I just try and give a good message, I guess. Um, I suppose that is kind of fitness Avenger, isn't it? There are, there are, I, like, I like people who are genuine, you know, in, on YouTube. I like people who are genuine. I like people who try and help because that's the vibe I'm on. Somebody mentioned in the comments um, from my last video that if I wanted to blow up the channel, I should cause a lot of drama and beef with people, you know. <laughs> but I, I don't know about that. I mean, I think I prefer just to um, try and help people. That's what I've done my whole life. And if that means the channel blows up, then great. But um, yeah, I mean, bear in mind, you know, my, my main work is my clients and that's why I spend most of my time on um, helping them making sure we're getting results um, and, and everything that comes with that. You, you know, you're learning, you're learning all the time. So yeah, how does it feel whenever I have amazing success? Well, let me, let me show you a few examples of where I've had amazing success. There's a guy that came to me a few years ago. He was probably about three or four years ago now. And he was about 70 to 80 pounds overweight. Like he'd really gotten in bad shape. Now this guy's a super nice guy, very productive. You know, he's got a family, um, a good job. Um, you know, a bunch of kids and uh, a loving wife. He just have, he just found himself, you know, usual story, midlife, gotten way out of shape. So he hired me and we worked together for a while. And um, the initial cut was losing about 70 pounds of body fat. Now that alone in itself is amazing. And it was a life-changing difference. And then after that, we put on about 20 pounds of muscle on him over the course of the next couple of years. So the actual beginning to end transformation was incredible. It was insane. Like imagine a 70 pound fat loss alongside a 20 pound muscle gain. He just looked like a different person and he looked younger. Um, plus, you know, given his age and the fact he was about six, four, he, he was pretty big. I thought, great V taper, big quads, everything. So that was probably one of my, one of my favorite wins. And, you know, we're friends for life now, you know, uh, it was quite funny because he said his uh, his wife even said to him, "What were you doing before you hired Faz?" <laughs> so that was nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it feels great. Like it feels, it feels like you've actually made a difference in someone's life because he wasn't doing it necessarily for, um, he wasn't doing it necessarily for aesthetic reasons because he had a wife who loved him. He had kids. He wasn't like a flashy guy. Um, he was doing it more for health reasons and self mastery. And that's a really genuinely nice feeling. Not that there's anything wrong with aesthetics, by the way. This is because it's not. But um, like, if you want to look jack, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. But um, like, it's just nice because he was doing it for for a lot of very good, very genuine reasons. He's just a nice, ordinary guy with a nice heart, and he wanted to get in shape to be the best shape for his girls, be the best shape for his wife that he could. That felt great because I know it had a massive impact on his quality of life, and in the future for his quality of life as well as he as he gets older. So that feels great. Um, and it was an example of where we gain muscle rather than just drop fat. Another example is um, a guy called Mark. He was one of my first clients. He was a guy who was natural. Well, he is natural. Um, and I say that because the rate of weight gain will surprise you. He was natural, but he had, it, over the years, he had kept his body weight too low. So he ended up being quite skinny fat. So when he, when he met me, he didn't really look like he trained because he had held back his body weight so often and so much, he never really gained any muscle. So, and because he never gained any muscle, although he was very light, he looked skinny fat. So he was like 10 stone or 11 stone, whatever it was, but he looked skinny fat, even though he had trained for like eight years at this point. So when I got hold of him, we immediately just bulked, <laughs> you know, I just force feeding him food over and over and over, increase over the, over the weeks. And, uh, you know, he, 
his, he had a really crazy metabolism because it would just upregulate loads. So by the end of it, we were on a lot of calories for a 160 pound natural. We were on like four to 5,000 calories. I think 5,000. So anyway, um, after we put on so much muscle, we then shredded down and we actually did a bodybuilding show. But what was gratifying was ever since then, he's always been jacked and he just stayed lean because we've pushed up his level of muscle mass so high, it's easy for him to stay lean now. He look, looks pretty much shredded all the time and he's natural. It's great. It's amazing. But it, it, that was another good example of, okay, this is the power. Most people want to lose weight, but this is the power of actually pumping a guy full of food, bringing up his musculature. And he's kept that for life now. Um, he's less obsessive about training now because he's like, you know, I've, I've made it, <laughs> you know, he's made it. Um, since then, he had a kid, so he probably won't compete again for a while. But um, I mean, you know, it, it's great. It, it's a great feeling because you change someone's life. And this guy was also a part-time PT, so it was good for his business as well because he would take, he would put a picture of himself and look amazing. So you can do that. You know, it's it's great. So um, it feels good because mostly you you make a difference in someone's life. And a lot of times, there are other things as well. I mean, it's too numerous to mention, but I've helped people with eating disorders as well. Um, there was a girl in the past, she, she was always struggling with eating disorders. I have some knowledge in that area. I helped her out and she's just able to have a better relationship with her body, better relationship with food. Now I still keep in touch with her about two years later. She's still doing great. Weight hasn't come back on. She hasn't get back, back in her bad habits or anything. She knows the tools necessary to be able to do what she needs to do for her body and fuel herself. And she feels great. And like, that's a young girl who's right at the beginning of her life, you know, and she was lumbered with so much guilt and anxiety over eating sort of, and first to see her prospering, it's, it's a great feeling, you know, it's, it really is great. So it's a very gratifying job in that situation. Um, yeah. So uh, hopefully that's uh, kind of answered your question. Quite self-indulgent last question, but um, hopefully you guys found it useful anyway. And I will uh, speak to you guys in part four, which hopefully finish off the rest of these questions.